Wow, thank you, Sam, so much. And uh, thank you to everyone who spoke this morning. You really set such a solid foundation for this conversation and invigorated all of us. Uh, and uh, we're well on our way to having a very productive three days. And I am just so really honored and pleased to be here with Marina and Lauren to have the, continue the conversation that you started for us, Sam. I have the privilege of being able to work with these two leaders on a pretty regular basis, actually. Uh, as you know, I've become rather fond of public-private partnership for security for the space sector, and they're both doing excellent work in public-private partnership themselves, and really uh, leading the way towards transformational change in their respective areas. So we're going to have a discussion about cybersecurity, critical infrastructure, incident response, and commercial protection here. And I'm really looking forward to all of you learning from Marina and Lauren about the work that they do and really shining a spotlight on the what's to come in the future with you two leading the way. So I want to start with having you just give us a little bit about your background. Tell us how did you get here and uh, let the audience get to know you a little bit. How about we start with you, Marina? Sure. So thanks, Aaron, for that introduction. Um, pleasure to be here. So uh, my, name, my name is Marina Haig. I'm with the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and the National Intelligence Manager for Space's office. And in that office, I handle um, both the commercial space policy and initiatives function, but then also the broader interagency policy um, piece across all topics. So working with Lauren quite a bit, as well as a lot of her colleagues um, at the White House and in the, in the interagency. I'm about 10 months uh, into what will be a two to three year stint at ODNI. I'm on a joint duty assignment from NGA, uh, where I was working in source operations, um, also looking at space policy there, but from a more operations perspective, um, particularly non-Earth imaging, or the now declassified term sat squared. Um, so looking at how we bring in commercial data how we integrate it with existing data and you know, push it into our systems to make it actually usable for our analysts. Um, before that, I spent time at the Department of Commerce in the Office of Space Commerce, Commerce where I was working on the implementation for Space Policy Directive 3 um, about SSA, um, transferring that function over to the Department of Commerce. Um, before that was in uh, commercial consulting. So I kind of fell into space by accident, to be honest. I really had no intention to work in the space industry. It was not an interest of mine. Um, <laughs> it is now, don't worry. But um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, my, my master's degree was in uh, defense and strategic studies with an emphasis in nuclear deterrence theory. So that was what I'd intended to go into um, following school. But I, and I can't emphasize this enough, when I got out of school, I just really needed a job. And uh, space was what was Open. Somebody wanted to give me a job in that area, and I've been doing space ever since. Um, yeah. You're speaking my language there, actually. <laughs> All right, Lauren. Thanks, Aaron. Again, so much for, for having uh, both me and my colleague Anjana, who spoke a little bit earlier uh, here at this conference. It's really fantastic for us to get to see so many familiar faces around the room who we either you know transcripted into our our workshops along the way, um, but we just really, um, or, or um, voluntarily uh, joined us along this journey, but we really um, benefited a lot from working with all of you. Um, a lot of parallels, uh, Marina, I think in your, your story um, to mine uh, and how I came to work at the intersection of space cybersecurity issues, which I also did not expect uh, to be where, where I would end up. And I also um, began my career um, in national security policy issues and, and nuclear nonproliferation issues um, coming out of undergrad. Um, was working at the, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, uh, kind of on the think tank side of things. And uh, when I moved, first moved into government, um, my first role was at the National Nuclear Security Administration, um, thinking about uh, nonproliferation export control issues and engaging with um, international partners there. Uh, and similarly, I, I was looking for uh, a job and a kind of a transition um, into kind of the, the defense policy space. Um, and several years ago, as, as you all know, there really was a sea change in terms of um, the number of new institutions either being created uh, when it comes to the, the U.S. Space Force um, or kind of reorganized or reinvigorated when it comes to U.S. Space Command. Um, and then uh, kind of in the D.C. Pentagon um, arena, uh, a new office um, was being our new office um, that was kind of being uh, bolstered um, at the time um, was the Assistant Secretary of Defense Office for Space Policy. And so in looking for um, kind of a growth opportunity for myself, that's where uh, I found um, my career in defense policy issues beginning. 
Um, and at that time, there was a lot of conversation, more conversation, I think, than ever about how to better leverage and integrate commercial space capabilities into the Department of Defense's thinking about bolstering uh, resilience to space systems. Um, and surprisingly, that com well, maybe surprisingly uh, to some, but not in this room, that conversation really has um, kind of exponentially increased even just over the last several years um, as there's been increasing uh, interest in, in recognition that growth is happening outside of the government as much as it is um, inside. Uh, so that's where I began my journey in space policy issues, thinking about um, uh, conversations at that time such as what, are, what do rules of the road look like when it comes to developing responsible behaviors in space, um, worked on those sorts of things. And then, uh, maybe um, most surprising of all to me, when I uh, was tapped on the shoulder to join a new office at the White House, uh, the Office of the National Cyber Director, um, a little bit over a year ago, I thought I was uh, ending my career in space policy and uh, going to become a cyber person. And then I walked in the door, and my colleagues had different uh, ideas um, for how we could kind of leverage um, that background and experience that I had coming over from the Pentagon into a really incredible, uh, really critical. Um, issues such as uh, thinking about how the White House, along with our partners um, at the National Security Council, National Space Council, um, could really generate um, uh, focus um, and uh, attention on the critical issue of cybersecurity for space systems. Um, and so it's been an incredible journey over the last year with a real focus on an emphasis on collaboration with pr uh, private sector partners um, because we can't uh, get to common solutions without um, incredible support from, um, from those outside of the government. I'll stop there. Thank you both for sharing about uh, your backgrounds and how you got here. I can tell, and I know even just from uh, engaging with both of you and people in the community that you are leaving a, we'll say, a lasting legacy with the work that you've already done. Um, so we really want to hear more about that. Uh, Marina, I know from working with you, uh, you have been instrumental to making the IC, the Intelligence Community Commercial Space Council, a success in developing a roadmap and a pathway for new plans and policies and programs. So I would really like it if you could share just uh, kind of as, far, as much as you can, you know, we only have 30 minutes here, about that program that you've developed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, since I've been uh, with ODNI, and actually even before that, when I was working with the IC Commercial Space Council, um, and, and I was the chair of the Outreach and Engagement Working Group, and still am, um, we started thinking about commercial protection. And there are a number of reasons that we started thinking about this, but primarily because we're, you know, as a government, transitioning to the idea that we are going to increasingly rely on commercial space systems, commercial space companies, you know, as we, you know, conduct our regular government operations on a day-to-day -day basis, but as, also as we move down the spectrum of, you know, competition, con conflict, etc. Um, so we're going to start relying on those more. So if we're going to start relying on them, and if we're going to rely on them in an effective manner, then we need to make sure that that data is actually available to us when we need it. So, you know, for very selfish reasons, we want to make sure that the commercial industry has the information they need and the awareness that they need of the threats that are out there and what to do about it to make sure that they're postured in a way that they can continue providing those services uh, through competition, potentially through conflict, you know, as far down that spectrum as we can get them, and, and so that they're, you know, doing so those operations in a safe and sustainable manner. So that was really the driving force behind us starting to look at this issue. Um, so since then, um, there's been a, a great deal of work that's gone on with this across the government. And I imagine most of the folks in the audience or a number of the folks in the audience are aware of some of the um, mechanisms out there for sharing this kind of data, the, the commercial integration cell out of Vandenberg, um, the NRO NGA uh, Space Command Tri-Seal Agreement, um, and, and several others up at NSA, up at NGA, and then uh, the, inf the uh, initiative that we're working at ODNI as well. And what that really is, is we saw all these different mechanisms getting stood up or expanding across the government. And we said, this is, this is great. This is exactly what we want. But we're not doing this in a very cohesive manner yet. Um, so we want to make sure that what we're doing is looking at the commercial industry and saying, you know, we are going to provide you guys with an understanding of how you fit into you know, the architecture writ large and how we look at you as a commercial industry and where you fit in that commercial industry with regards to what the government will provide for you. So uh, we kind of think of this as concentric circles, and we'll be, I've talked about this before. Um, you know, you've got that tightest little circle, and those are the companies that have contracts with the government that are active. They're providing data or some kind of service 
and they also have classified communications. So those are the guys that are those right in the fold. And then there's the next circle out from there. It's a little bit bigger, and it's the folks who have those contracts but don't necessarily have the classified communications. They're doing different kinds of data and services. Um, also, you know, very tight with the government, just a different kind of communication level. And then you've got that largest circle outside of that, which is the folks who probably don't have contracts with the government yet, or maybe they have contracts, but they're, you know, a little bit different. They're developmental contracts. Maybe it's the startup companies. Maybe it's companies where, you know, government just really isn't their business model. Um, but they hold a U.S. license, and by virtue of that, and by virtue of being part of the space industry, which we care about innately as the government, then you know we believe that they are entitled to some level of you know awareness about threats, and we should be you know providing that information them to them as as best as possible. And that's really where the ODNI um, initiative falls. Is that largest circle? We're going to try to throw it open to you know as many commercial companies in the U.S. as possible. Really, the um, we're getting ready to roll out, out this in the next couple of months probably. But the the criteria for being a part of this is that you hold a U.S. license somewhere, and that could be FAA, that could be FCC, NOAA, etc. Um, we're not you know limiting it to one kind of company, and it may actually go beyond that at some point because we really do want to cast that net large as large as possible. But starting out with operators primarily. And it's going to be a mechanism that is, you know, voluntary reporting. Um, we would like companies, to, you know, we'll give them a point of contact, we'll give them guidance on what we would like them to tell us, and it's basically just going to be that they can tell us when they experience something in their system that they can't close within their own systems, an anomaly that just doesn't look right, doesn't feel right, doesn't make sense. And that data is, it's not necessarily that we're going to be, you know, looking at that and then doing incident response. But it's a way for us to suck in that information and understand the kind of threats that the industry is experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's really going to inform our thinking about what do we need to provide industry? What kind of you know, threats are they experiencing? Are they experiencing attacks regularly? It's almost like we'll be able to you know, get a better sense of what the overall threat picture is. Because right now we see the government threat picture. We see when our systems you know, get you know, messed with a little bit. We see when other commercial systems that are on contract get messed with a little bit. But we're not seeing the whole picture. And I think we really need to have that understanding to understand then what to do about it, where we're going to go, and to really build that relationship between government and industry. So that's the initiative that ODNI is working on, um, and, and it's going to certainly be in concert with the other efforts that are going on across the government. So we'd like this to be sort of a tiered approach, uh, you know, possibly run out of different areas across the government, but very much integrated to the extent possible. Excellent. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much for all of that background. You know, Space ISAC, uh, we're working with the team that's doing the tri seal agreement. We're working with your team. These are really significant milestones, I think, for our community to share information about threats and vulnerabilities. And it's a part of the picture, like you've described. And uh, there's, you know, a lot of great work that's being done across the U.S. government. Another a good example is Lauren's work. So I really love it if you could share with us in some level of detail the work that you've championed in space system cybersecurity and critical infrastructure over the last several months. Absolutely. No, and again, it's, it's so great to hear um, about the work that Marina is doing because, as she mentioned, it obviously very much um, dovetails from the you know, intelligence community's point of view with the work uh, that the White House has taken on uh, kind of at a uh, civil, national security, and, and commercial um, space ecosystem, kind of biggest picture um, national policy level. Um, and so to that, uh, I'd say where, where we began uh, about a year ago in terms of um, our efforts uh, out of the uh, ONCD, along with the, the NSC and the National Space Council, was thinking not only about, uh, as Marina um, talked about, that the threat picture, which is incredibly important, I think, to, to help kind of sharpen our focus as a um, U.S. government and a commercial space ecosystem, uh, Sam uh, talked earlier about um, the kind of very explicit threats um, that the uh, you know Russian uh, government has made um, in the context of U.S. commercial space uh, providers um, who are incredibly important uh, to this uh, conflict, and you know the role of the commercial space ecosystem is only going to grow. Um, and so that was very much one key element of um, focus. Um, how do we, um, as a White House and as a um, uh, interagency get after kind of the bigger picture threats that are 
uh, affecting our very inter interconnected ecosystem. Um, but we also didn't want to only think about the threats, and this gets um, to the, the themes um, that were talked about earlier of the national cybersecurity strategy, where we are trying to, we, we are prom promulgating an affirmative vision for the future of cyberspace, not only driven by the threats, but by the opportunities that exist. And um, I think the commercial space ecosystem is one of the most, if not the most, um, exciting examples of the, the opportunities um, that the private sector provides and that should be um, thought about in, in, in a holistic conversation um, when we're thinking about protecting um, the, US, uh, the US government and uh, commercial um, ecosystems from, from cyber threats. What are the opportunities that can be provided when we're all more cyber secure? So those were the sorts of conversations we were having early on. Um, and one thing that we really uh, chose to, to lean in on from the very beginning um, was making sure that the private sector was, uh, the private, private space industry um, sector was um, very integral to uh, our approach to thinking about how we shape the national policy uh, landscape. Um, again, thinking back to that um, existing national policy, Space Policy Directive 5, which is a set of high level principles um, that are um, that are important, that are critical for us to aspire to, um, but kind of lack at the moment um, implementable guidance. Um, and so, um, what we attend, what we set out to do was to really lean into public-private collaboration. And so that began, um, as mentioned earlier, with an executive forum that we held at the White House, where we started with with a top-down um, approach uh, to pulling CEOs together um, in a room and uh, emphasizing, emphasizing to them through um, a threat briefing, which was, uh, again, important for kind of sharpening our focus, and an open session um, that the White House was really interested in this issue and would need uh, the support and the prioritization of CEOs kind of from the top down um, of the key companies on um, the space ecosystem. And then very quickly, we um, you know, didn't just want to have kind of the high, high level conversations um, we very quickly uh, embarked on a um, kind of a working uh, technical level uh, approach um, where we as the White House um, decided to take a listening um, take a listening approach uh, to engaging with the private sector which I think is um, is a different way of the US government kind of engaging uh, with the private sector and it really uh, paid out um, bore out for us and so from our first conversations that we held um, in California um, and large thanks to, to partnership with NASA uh, who, who really opened up their, their facilities to us across the country as well as US Space Command um, when we came here to Colorado Springs, we just started convening um, companies uh, in each one of those kind of key, um, key five hubs of space industry across the country and pulled people together. And we weren't quite sure from the beginning whether you know, companies were going to be open, they were going to be you know, willing to kind of share um, key insights with us about you know, how they are currently implementing cybersecurity by design. What does that mean? Uh, what are best practices across industry? And we thought those might be, you know, those might be uh, maybe for forward, more forward-leaning than um, our approaches here in the US government. And so we really wanted to draw those, um, those insights out from industry. Um, we weren't sure how open um, private sector was going to be from the beginning, but we were, we were kind of blown away from our first conversation out in California Springs at how, um, how interested people were in sharing their insights and helping us think um, about how we can address some of the most critical uh, gaps and challenges at the national policy level. So all through the spring and summer, we were all around the country um, until just um, a couple of months ago, we finished our our series um, in Houston and Texas, and very quickly um, kind of took those insights back um, into the policy process, um, which uh, Marina um, noted um, is, is very much underway um, internal to the US government. Because um, all along, we wanted to make sure that we were um, being good stewards of the information that we, we gained from, from all of you um, being so open and sharing your insights with us about challenges such as threat information sharing and the multiple kind of vectors for information sharing um, from the federal government point of view um, to, out to the private sector that exists today and how we could think about from a national policy level um, kind of streamlining those and ensuring that you know who to go to or who to call um, when there are incidents. So those are, that's just one kind of a big picture takeaway um, that we gained from those conversations and are feeding back into the policy process, which is currently ongoing and is a, you know, a privilege for us to be able to feed the insights and share those um, that we gained from all of you with our US government partners so they have a better sense of what, again, those 300 participants and 125 companies, um, large and small, um, and everything in between, um, had to say about kind of the state um, of, of cybersecurity across the space ecosystem. Um, and so that's, that's where we are today. 
Thank you, Lauren. And it's always great to hear who is really taking responsibility for these uh, important decisions because, you know, in the private sector, we're having conversations with over 50 different government agencies. And so knowing who is championing threat sharing for cybersecurity incidents for space systems is really important. So appreciate both of your work. And um, I want to share that, you know, since our Space ISAC Watch Center opened um, in March of this year, then we've been observing a number of attacks on space systems and seeing that the commercial sector is willing to collaborate and have public-private partnership conversations about attacks against their space systems. And I've begun to start to hypothesize that there's probably no going back. You know, we're not going to see fewer attacks over time. I think some of our keynote speakers this morning have um, hit on that, is that space systems are becoming more proliferated and there will be more capability, not less capability, and more attack surface rather than less. So with the number of ransomware attacks that we're seeing in the watch center, the number of RF interference attacks, spoofing, jamming, and um, even laser dazzling capabilities that are out there, the future of monitoring uh, attacks on space vehicles is um, increasing. So I'm wondering from both of your perspective, uh, you know, how do, how does both of your work kind of come together and what do you see, think is the future of this? You know, are we going to be able to develop more policies and procedures that are going to support industry as they're potentially going to be asking for resources and indemnification and an agency to coordinate with during incident response? Yeah. Sure, I'll go. Yeah, so th I think there's a lot of work for the government still to do here, um, which isn't always a bad thing. I think we're making a lot of progress. Um, what I would like to, I'll tell you what I want the future to look like. Perfect, <laughs> yes. Um, I would like there to be a clear understanding across both government and industry about who's doing what in the government. Um, and I think we, you know, first of all, need to do a better job of communicating who's doing what, which means that we have some decisions to make internally. Um, I talked about the concentric circles idea earlier. Ideally, what I would like is for every company who works with the government or is part of the space sector to understand which circle they fall into. And by virtue of understanding which circle they fall into, then understand where they go in the government to you know, get information that they need, to provide information that they have. So that there's a, you know, a set exchange of data and that, that exchange of data can grow over time. But that you know, companies and industry sectors know where they are in that picture, they know what to expect, they know what's expected of them. I think that's, that's the way forward, and I think that would be a great start in you know, advancing commercial protection. Commercial protection is kind of a blanket term, right, and there's a lot of things that fall under that. So this is really just the threat data sharing piece of that. But if we can get that piece squared away, then I think that opens up the path to then you know, push down further and say, okay, you know, what's next? What's next with this relationship between commercial and industry? How, we, how can we get tighter and make that more profitable for both industry and the government to make sure that both sides are getting what they need um, to really be able to work together well to get ahead of threats, get ahead of the adversary, start using that to our benefit. So that, that's what I'd like to see. We're counting on you, Marina. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Lauren, what do you think? Yeah, I think the, the first thing uh, that I would say is that, you know, the U.S. government's uh, commitment to protecting its interests in the you know, space ecosystem and space domain is, is the same as it is in any other domain. So I think that's the, the first point I would make. Um, yeah, and in terms of the world that I would like to see and maybe the current, um, one of the, the bigger picture kind of current policy challenges, I think that that is on us, us and the federal government uh, to think about, including um, given the conversations that we had uh, across industry and with our, our government partners who own and operate a wide range of missions, are operating in every you know, space mission area, um, is, is thinking about how at the national policy level um, there might be or we, we, we might be able to find a balance between what are some common kind of minimum sorts of baseline uh, cybersecurity practices that should be in place, I think, across all of the concentric circles um, that you mentioned to kind of bolster our baseline of, of protection uh, to cyber, cyber threats uh, in particular. Where do we find, you know, that balance um, in, in contrast to thinking, again, about all of the different, you know, risk profiles, the different missions 
um, uh, you know, purely commercial uh, space um, operations uh, to all the way on the spectrum of those that are very closely integrated with, um, with U.S. government uh, operations as well. How can we also find a balance between um, flexibility um, when it comes to kind of the difference in, in risk profiles and different um, types of, of operations uh, that are out there today? So I think that's, that's kind of a key challenge um, for, for us in government today, but, but one that's really worth, I think, diving into and thinking about from a national policy level. If, if we can make that happen, <clears throat> we'd be in excellent shape. Very difficult. Yes. Uh, so with only a few minutes left and two more presenters before lunch, which are going to be, uh, I'm really looking forward to their presentations, I want to ask you probably the hardest question of the morning, and that is if people were to come up to you and want to have an honest, candid conversation um, from kind of an industry, commercial, international perspective um, during the rest of the summit, what topics would you uh, feel your office really needs insight on right now that you could share with all of us? Sure. I, well, I'll be short because I don't think it will surprise anyone. Um, it's really, you know, how can existing policy, um, you know, how can we make adjustments to existing policy today, uh, specifically the national policy out there, that can, you know, better take into account um, the, the views and perspectives, you know, of, of the private sector and of commercial space industry. That really is the, the challenge that we're, we're in the process um, that we're, we're engaging in, in today. Um, and, you know, insights um, that, the, the more insights that we can gain from, you know, across the, uh, the incredibly dynamic, you know, U.S. commercial space ecosystem, um, you know, adding to that, that number, uh, that 300, you know, people that we've talked to already, um, would, I think, would um, help us to feel like we have kind of the best um, understanding of, of what uh, the needs are of the private sector today so that, you know, as we go back into policy making circles, we are uh, um, careful not to, to be making decisions in silos. Um, so uh, we will be here for the rest of the day and, and, and that um, kind of opportunity or offer uh, stands. We're very, very interested in hearing from all of you. Yeah, yeah, and I'll second the policy piece of that. Um, that'll be interesting for us, too. I think we should also get a better understanding of what industry's expectations and needs are when it comes to, you know, threat sharing and data sharing. Um, we've had some of those conversations already. I think there's room for more um, to really get a good sense of, you know, what do we need to be able to provide? How do we provide that? What do you need? And then, you know, what's, what's the back and forth there? I think that would be helpful. Well, please take up the opportunity to talk to Marina and Lauren throughout the rest of the event. Thank you both so much for your ongoing partnership. It's, like I said, it's such a privilege and an honor to work with both of you and to continue this mission. It's a multi-decade effort that we're, we're taking on here, so I, I really appreciate the having partnerships, and I know everyone here from the private sector does as well, and academia and others. So uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap up, and thank you so much, everyone, for listening. I'll yield back my two minutes and 30 seconds to our next presenters. Thank you.